think Jane's perception of beauty does not come down to like what someone looks like. It comes from their mm-hmm. actions. So I think that was one of the first seeds that was planted here in the story of when she receives kindness, she finds beauty in someone. And I loved that. It is him being rebellious and being strong that she gets what she really wanted from them, which is attention and affection. Yeah, I I really love what you said, Lillian, where Jane carries Helen's light forward in life. And that is beautiful. That's, I love that. Lillian, hello. How are you? Hello, I'm doing so well. It's all sunny and shiny and, you know, it's a Thursday afternoon slash morning. <laughs> yeah, sure is. Lillian, I know that you're a pretty avid reader and I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, um, is, have you read anything interesting lately that our, our listeners might be interested in knowing about? Um, I'm reading a book called Iron Widow, but I don't know if that's... <laughs> oh, Jane Eyre. I also am reading Jane Eyre. What? what? Oh my God. No way. What a coincidence. I've also started reading Jane Eyre and uh, this episode, we're talking about it. We're, we, we're finally doing it. That's actually <laughs> really convenient that both of us read the same number of pages of Jane Eyre in preparation for talking about it. We're cool. <laughs> wow. We're cool. We're also so clever with the silly opening, but uh, um, yeah, Lillian, tell us what chapters have we read that we are going to be discussing today? Um, well, we read, obviously started with chapter one. So the unique hot take that we, we chose to do. And then we read <laughs> through chapter 10, which for those of you who um, maybe haven't memorized the exact chapters of Jane Eyre and when, what happens when we, we left off with Jane is now a full adult at 18 years old. She did it <laughs> and she is getting a new job. And she just heard back from a lady called Mrs. Fairfax uh, saying that she can have this job. So she's, she's getting out of there. She's heading, she's heading out of Lillwood and she's going to go somewhere else and it's going to be totally fine and not a problem at all. (laughs) Yeah. I, so we, we mentioned at the end of last week's episode that the way that we're going to go about reading and assessing and reacting to the source material, Jane Eyre, the novel, is by breaking the story up into different kind of significant chunks of her life. So yes, we decided to begin with the childhood before she goes to Thornfield. So this Mm -hmm. is where we're starting. I guess, Lillian, before we dive into uh, character and analysis and plot and theme and all kinds of other beautiful things that we're ready to discuss, I'm curious, what was sort of your mindset when you were, you know, sitting down to read this? Were you like, I'm going to make a kind of comfy space for myself, really get in the zone? Was it just simply like, oh, I've finished cooking. I'm just going to read a few pages and then go off and do something else. How do you like create the atmosphere for reading Jane Eyre? Yeah. So I read a lot, like so much, like I read like multiple books a week, a lot. Uh, so what I did, what I was really careful about and very conscious of is like reading is sort of something that I'm just like, and like at the end of the day, you turn on an episode of TV, I pick up a book. Like it's, and I don't mean that in the way that it sounded as that came out, which is like, I'm just like so smart. And like, it's not, <laughs> You're it's like, usually plebes might watch television, but I usually, prefer to expand my brain. It's usually garbage in the same way <laughs> that like a really cool TV show can have a lot of intellectual value. A lot of books can have no intellectual value. <laughs> um, no, and it's those about- are the ones. I read. <laughs> Lillian, it's entertainment. It's about what makes you happy, right? How yes. how are you engaged? So I so I was very careful and very conscious. It's interesting that you brought up like the space that I read. I was very careful and very conscious to not accidentally lump in the reading of Jane Eyre in that like casual, I just do what I feel kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I actually very intentionally read it really slowly and I took a lot of notes. I haven't annotated a book since I was in high school and was reading for lit classes in high school, I took some like literature ish things in college, but not in the way that like, I used to do passage analysis in high school. Like Mm -hmm. I did, I took really intense literature classes and then went, I will never use that skill again. Wrong. (laughs) And so it was actually so much fun to like sit down and really highlight oh my God, this passage is like exactly this and all of that stuff. I created that space. And I also listened to Jane Eyre movie soundtracks because I like to have instrumental music in the background. And I messaged you this already, but what I didn't know is 
the 1970s TV movie, one of the top two adaptions of Jane Eyre for both of us, mm-hmm. the v- musical score for that was by John Williams, awesome. who did like Star Wars and Indiana <laughs> Jones and also the Jane Eyre TV movie in the 70s. <laughs> well, it was also like a theatrical release overseas. So, but still, that's awesome. They they brought in the big guns for this. <laughs> I also was trying to make sort of like a, a mood space uh, when I was reading this, because again, I wanted to be very aware and in the moment. I do not actively read very often in my free time. I'm very much a, a TV or a movie person. But when I do you know, I'm, it's similar to when I do creative writing, I like to create like an atmosphere. And so fortunately, we had lots of rainy days uh, while I was reading this, which just felt appropriate. So I would like light a candle or, you know, just have like the lighting just right. But for my first big chunk of reading this, I went out to a local brewery, sat out on the patio, took some nice pictures out in the sunshine. It was really great. And I loved that. I think, just to kind of get into initial gut reactions, you know, before I went into this, I was really wondering, I'm like, is this going to be a slow, difficult read? And it was not that at all. I was instantly struck by, I think, how natural and modern her voice is as a writer. And that really kept me easily engaged and instantly, you know, into this, like brought me into the story. So whether it was sunny or stormy, it didn't really matter because the book itself uh, compelled me. So it was a fun, a fun way to start the story. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it was really interesting given we're talking about a section of the book that covers the plot that I am most apt to complain about, Mm -hmm. um, which is Jane's childhood. We all know that I hate it so much. (laughs) Um, And it was so interesting to read that in the book and simultaneously go, this adds so many things that I could, I did not have previously. This adds layers that I did not have previously. Some of those, I was like, I can't believe you aren't finding a way to make this in the movie. Like this is so critical and makes, and makes me go, Oh my God, well, that's what you were trying to do there. You just failed literally every time. Mm -hmm. And then the flip side of that is also like, I completely understand why you can't and haven't put this in movies. What a cool thing to now have having read the book as just another layer of understanding. Um, So I'm excited to talk about all of that and the characters and what are, what were your initial reactions to the actual book and your rainy candlelit atmosphere? I I think I agree with something that we said at the end of last week's episode where you mentioned, you know, you were grateful for having seen Pride and Prejudice before you read Pride and Prejudice. Cause there Mm -hmm. were definitely some moments where if I didn't already know the story and everything, there'd probably be chunks where I might be inclined to be like, well, this isn't important. I can kind of breeze over this. Mm -hmm. And so having the awareness of the story really held my attention. And I felt almost like I was looking for clues, Mm -hmm. which I found a lot of them. And there's so much interesting foreshadowing of different things in the beginning chapters that I'm like, oh my gosh, this is really crucial to something that's going to happen later on. I know that from like already knowing the story. And for me, like I can see where some people might come in and say, well, that's like a spoiler, right? I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm someone who loves to watch like a mystery or a thriller. And then like instantly I want to rewatch it and go back and look for the clues and the little like hints and things. So that's kind of been what this initial read through experience has been for me, which I've really enjoyed. Absolutely. I completely agree. It does feel like it's something that is hard to capture these layers in a movie, especially when you can't assume that a, somebody knows it mm-hmm. where in a book, you have so much more space to like lay the groundwork of like, here's just a bunch of things that I'm telling you, and maybe they're important and maybe they're not. And then yeah. like being able to go through and be like, Oh my God, well, she's mentioning this. And then that's related to this and all of that stuff, which I do want to call out. I felt a little bit in, in prepping notes for this, you and I chatted just a scooch about how we wanted to talk about this and and how we wanted to approach it. And it was hard to not fall down the rabbit hole of, oh my God, well, this is a reference to this, which is a reference to this at the time. And like really, really deep into particular moments and particular passages. And I think Mm -hmm. that is absolutely something that you can. And if you love Jane Eyre, should do. Mm -hmm. There are, as we mentioned previously, podcasts that go into that level of detail. I highly recommend listening to both of the ones we mentioned previously. The 
Jane Eyre files. Is that, does she use the full name? Okay. Which that is a correction that I have from last week. <laughs> um, the Jane Eyre files are done by Charlene, who <laughs> is all over online talking about Jane Eyre. If you haven't heard of Charlene, you maybe haven't Googled Jane Eyre as much as I have. She's a well-known I, person. <laughs> I, called her, I called her Charlotte. And that is actually the name of the author of the book, Jane Eyre. Well, you know, any fan I think would be honored. So uh, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I'm I, Piper says you're welcome. I say I'm so sorry. I didn't know that that wasn't your name. It was just my brain was so confident anyway. And then the other one you mentioned is On Air. Is that... Oh, no. Um, it was, I think I was, that was the name of that season. Um, yeah. But yes, it's from the Hot and Bothered podcast, yes. season three. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. And I listened to their first episode and then realized I sh- I will listen to it at some point. Couldn't listen to it in preparation from, for this because I would have just been like, oh my God, they mentioned this thing. <laughs> like, right. it just exactly. Our little fan cast of like, they did this whole research thing about the word bird. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, which no. is true. Go yeah. listen to the podcast and find out why birds are important. It's it's very, very good. But yeah, we kind of discussed off air that sort of the way we want to organize our thoughts on this was kind of by talking about, you know, major themes that we see mm-hmm. in these early chapters, and then also kind of breaking down like some characters and, and things like that. So Lillian, is there a particular spot where you feel that we should start? Because otherwise I could go to. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start with this is, I think, something we're going to talk about within other moments moments as well. But one of the big themes, I actually have different colored tabs for my different things that I looked at. And one of the tabs that I put in that I used by far the most for this is Jane's strength. Nice. And the way that they lay the groundwork for, it's something we talk about a lot in these different adaptions, which is how Jane has this very particular type of feminine strength. Mm -hmm. And it's not about putting her hands on her hips and breaking bases. It's about this other kind of very feminine strength because there's a very limited scope that we as a society then and now allow women to be strong. Mm -hmm. And Jane, as a child, reading through her childhood, something that I feel like I'm now disappointed has never really been captured in any of these adaptions that we've seen is her exploration of those different kinds of strength and finding her way through that. Yeah. Um, And I really loved getting to be in her head and hear her strength and hear what she did and did not say and why and how she felt she should behave in a particular moment and then how she actually behaved in that moment. I thought that was so interesting and I really really loved that in, in this book. But before I monologue for an hour about Jane's strength, did you have anything around that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I I like what you said where you, you mentioned like where she gets those influences from. Cause I think that's a big thing that I was planning to talk about. The importance of establishing her childhood this way is we get to see the factors and the people that have made our main character who she is and why she reacts the way that she does later in life as an adult. So yeah, when you talk about strength, I instantly think of the positive influences in her life where the first one, even though it wasn't as kind as some of the later ones that I'm going to talk about is simply uh, Bessie, who Bessie, I thought in the book is so much better of a character than anything we've seen in a movie or TV adaptation so far. She's so much more complex. Most Mm -hmm. movies and shows I've seen, I feel like they make Bessie off as like barely tolerant of Jane and like there's like a shred of kindness and then she's just gone. And I, Mm -hmm. I think here... There's this interesting level of complexity to her that what I was really picking up on is this is a woman who wants to care for this child. She has like organic natural sympathy for her, but I think she's also a woman who is incredibly stressed living in this household. Mm -hmm. She's a worker, so she's got tons of like work that she has to do on top of all of this. But also, it's just really interesting. There are moments where Jane talks about her kindness. There's a line that struck me, and it was on page 34. And it's this idea that when Bessie is gentle to Jane, she becomes the prettiest being. And maybe I can look up the exact quote of this. Yeah, it's it's so amazing to listen to Bessie described as like the the counter to these other people, which I think is if you're referencing the moment that I think you are, that it's in the space that Jane is in. Bessie is the only light. And that put that really 
cast Bessie very differently than how I think we've seen her in a lot of the adaptions. Yeah, exactly. Um, the line here that I have highlighted is when thus gentle, Bessie seemed to me the best, prettiest, kindest being in the world. And I love that pretty is included in that because I think one thing I've made a lot of notes about is because I think, you know, of the line when Rochester asks if she finds him handsome and she says no, I think Jane's perception of beauty does not come down to like what someone looks like. It comes from mm -hmm. their actions. So I think that was one of the first seeds that was planted here in the story of when she receives kindness, she finds beauty in someone. And I loved that. Yeah. And I think that we see that in the descriptions of all the other characters as well, right? Like Georgiana and the other the other people in her family are supposed to be these great beauties with these blonde perfect ringlets and all of this stuff but they're horrible like so all oh, just incredibly awful like mm -hmm. I I truly hate them <laughs> um, but that's that's the other thing you mentioned with with Bessie and I think that this was something I actually wrote down was true of all of the characters in a way that I understand how hard this would be to put into an adaption, but also truly makes Jane Eyre one of those things that stands the test of time, which is they're all three-dimensional. Yes. I talk a lot about a thing that can put me off in a book or a movie or any work of fiction is if a character is, is so thin that they feel like a, a cardboard cutout that you could push over and there's nothing behind them. Mm -hmm. I feel like you could write an entire book about the character of Bessie and how and why she does the things that she does. Char other characters that like you see that same thing with is like John Reed. I hate him. Yeah. He's 14 <laughs> and I hate him. Yeah. And he's on page for like 15 seconds and she talks about him a little bit in her head, but the, the way that he is characterized in those handful of moments, he is a whole person. Mm -hmm. You can see so much of him and he's, he's an archetype for sure, but like he's, he's three-dimensional. You can, the references to him being off at school and he should still be at school. Like you can see this kid who like his mom came up with an excuse for how he's just like too special a boy to be at school when he's too <laughs> dumb and he's getting kicked out and is just an asshole. Like it's so good. And the same thing with like later on, we talk about, we'll see Mrs. Scatchard is a, um, one of the teachers. I'm like, again, not on there very often. I hate her. <laughs> She's so three-dimensional though. And I think Bessie is a great example of a character that there's just not time to explore all of these mm -hmm. characters to that level. But I do think there's, there's adaptions where they almost like attempt to do that. And because Bessie is a character is it, when you have that like five seconds of her at, in the childhood, you can pick which side of her you want to show. Do you want to yeah. show her being cruel to Jane or do you want to show her as the single point of kindness and light for Jane? Yeah. And she's all of that. Like she's, right. like you talked about, she's this overworked, underappreciated person who's expected to, to care for this child. And you can see the layers of that, right? Like I've mm -hmm. been a nanny before. I understand how the kid's behavior ultimately is brought back on you, whether good or bad, whether your fault or not. Yeah. And so Bessie is supposed to be in charge of Jane and Jane is actively hated. Right. So her choice is join the family and shitting on Jane, mm -hmm. including to Jane herself, mm -hmm. or be kind to a child and have your life be harder and more miserable when it's already going to be inherently difficult. Yeah. There's layers of sympathy that you have and understanding you have for Bessie. But at the same time, I'm just like sitting there screaming, being like, this little girl has no one who is nice to her. Yeah. And so she's accepting this like semi-abusive relationship mm -hmm. with this woman who's in this position of power. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to watch. I, I wrote down one of the things I wrote down, I think on the same page as the passage you read is somehow Bessie's ability to be kind to Jane mm -hmm. makes the moments when she's not kind to Jane more heartbreaking to me. Yes. Yeah. Because, because go, Mrs. Reed, <laughs> we both gesture to have the other person. <laughs> so you guys know what happens. So. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Reed, like she hates Jane. I, I don't think you get to hate a child. That's a whole other conversation we can have, but she hates Jane. She's never going to be kind to Jane. She doesn't like Jane. Fuck Jane in, mm -hmm. in Mrs. Reed's mind. That is 
And I can understand where that's coming from in the fact that there's layers to that character that make that understandable. Mm -hmm. But also I hate Mrs. Reed forever. I have no sympathy for her. I literally wrote down talking about her and and Brocklehurst. I hope hell is real so you can go there. Um, (laughs) Like that's how much I hate them. But Bessie is kind to Jane in moments and Mm -hmm. sees Jane as a child and understands that there's a person here that needs love and affection the way that we all need love and affection, especially children. Yes. And the fact that she still withholds that, Mm -hmm. oh my God, it hurt me every time. Well, it's, it's beautiful writing and it's beautiful complexity. I think one of the big points that I, I wrote here is one of my first notes is I feel Bronte does an amazing job of articulating the way that a child thinks and the way that they make sense of the world. And so, like you said, it hurts twice as much when Bessie removes that kindness or whatever. And so when you're this impressionable, lonely child and the one person who you thought was nice to you then turns around and does something mean that could be so earth shattering. And there are so many moments for little Jane that are terrifying and earth shattering. And I think it's really interesting, you know, after she passes out in the red room and she wakes up in the nursery, it's never said that, you know, she is depressed, but I'm like, this child has just like, kind of like sunken into herself and there's very little spark there, which is something that I do love that we do get rekindled eventually when she gets to Lowood. But the other big thing that struck me is so on page 21, this man comes, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Uh, I can look it up. Mr. Lloyd. Mr. Lloyd. And there's a line here. Let me pause real quick while I find this line because it's powerful. So Jane wakes up and the stranger is in the room. And so ere long, I became aware that someone was handling me, lifting me up and supporting me in a sitting posture. And that more tenderly than I had ever been raised or upheld before, I rested my head against a pillow or an arm and felt easy. Like she doesn't know if it's it's a a human body or a bed because it's just so comforting to her. And then another paragraph down, I felt an inexpressible relief a soothing conviction of protection and security when I knew that there was a stranger in the room, an individual not belonging to Gateshead and not related to Mrs. Reed. To find such comfort in a stranger for a young child, because she's like, that's not my family, the people who hurt and abuse me, therefore I feel safe. That is like, wow, this is the place where she starts her life. Yeah. And it, it, it really is heartbreaking. And I think the, one of the things you mentioned within there is the way that she expresses the way children think. And I think it's, it's one of the interesting pieces that I knew about the book, but reading it and experiencing it is so different. It's because the full name of Jane Eyre is Jane Eyre and the autobiography. And mm-hmm. the idea is she's writing it as if this is an autobiography she's writing as an adult mm-hmm. looking back. And I think that that it, there's something in that in the childhood that makes it so much more bearable mm-hmm. because this is so painful to read and all of this abuse and all of that stuff. And it also enables her to provide that context of how do children think? And it's, it's something that like when you're reading a book, that's supposed to be written from the perspective of a child as a child you can allude to that, but you can't differentiate between the way a child thinks and an adult thinks because you are an, you are a child. So how would you know how adults think? Exactly. Where having that kind of like hindsight look in her childhood adds such an incredible layer of complexity and understanding. And that moment with Mr. Lloyd, who's an apothecary, mm-hmm. because they invited an apothecary instead of a physician because they invite physicians for the family. Yes. And the oh apothecary comes to serve the servants. The apothecary, Mr. Lloyd, is actually, I, I noted down, he's a character that I believe we've only seen in the 73 TV adaption. He's also in the 80s one. Is he? Okay. Yes. Cause I, mm-hmm. I know I, I've kind of put down as a question mark as to whether or not I know he really stood out to me in the 73, but it's interesting that he's not in more adaptions. I felt very similarly about Mrs. Temple in that way, mm-hmm. where Miss Temple in that way, where I think having this incredibly dark space that Jane is raised in without a lot of comfort, without a lot of light, without a lot of people who are good and kind for the sake of being good and kind, Mm -hmm. having those handful of people like Mr. Lloyd is only in here for a hot minute. Mm -hmm. However, he 
actually treats Jane like a person and talks to her and understands her and asks her what she wants and actually sends Bessie out of the room so that he can have a moment to chat with her alone. Yeah. Understanding the sort of abusive situation that she's in where she can't be fully honest Mm -hmm. around people who are from this house. Because once again, there's an instance of Bessie turning against Jane and like mm-hmm. defending her. Cause when he's asking, you know, what happened, Bessie's like, she fell down, you know, classic like abuse cover up story. And it's like, you can leave. I need to talk to this child in a safe space. Again, it is more heartbreaking hearing that from Bessie, who is mm-hmm. her single point of light and comfort. Yeah. And to have this full stranger be more comforting to her, it, It sets up all of the reasons why, like all of these pieces for why Jane is so starved for affection and then goes to Thornfield and is open to this somewhat manipulative situation. Yeah. So that was sort of incredible is that's a great line to to kind of point out that we don't see in a lot of the adaptions and it's hard to do there, but also. Yeah. What did you say his name was again? Lloyd. Lloyd, Mr. Lloyd. So he also comes back to be kind of a savior again later for when Miss Temple, you mm-hmm. know, writes to him to say, can you con- confirm this story? He confirms it in the letter. And that is what partially brings Jane. It raises her respect again. And then she can kind mm-hmm. of start forward on this path at Lowood at a even plane where people respect and trust her. And she has this network of allies that she's starting to build. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's, it's, it's not surprising to me that they're, that she's connecting those points of light as like these people know each other and they, they have these relationships. I think that's very cool. At the very beginning of the story, one of the things we've talked about all these different experiences that Jane has had and how obviously abusive her experience at Gateshead has been. One of the things that I think was something that I picked up in the book that maybe it's just me being dense and not understanding the story, but I just don't think any adaption has fully captured is why the story starts where it starts. So Mm -hmm. most of the adaptions start with that moment of Jane hiding and reading a book and not being able to go on a walk that day. And then John Reed comes and finds her and he's too dumb to find her himself. So his sister has to do it (laughs) because the window's closed, but he's pretty sure she's in the room. Anyway, John's stupid. (laughs) And then he beats her with a book. And that is a shocking way to start the story. And I think most of the movies and TV shows that we've watched have started in that same moment. The part that I feel like has not been captured is why start the story there? Mm -hmm. And it's so much clearer in the book that the reason to start the story there is because that is the first time that Jane fights back. Yep. Up until then, she has tried being good. She, Mm -hmm. she, and not, not good in the way that I think a child should be good. Right. But in the way that these people have defined good, Mm -hmm. she has tried to fit their definition of that. She has done everything over and over and over again to be meek and submissive and do what they want and be the version of a person they want her to be. And she can't be it because it's an unreasonable expectation that changes when she meets it. That is, that is the reality of the, these kind of abusive situations and the situation that Jane is in. And she gets that this moment where she's being beaten with a book (laughs) is where she snaps and Mm -hmm. kind of goes, I'm over this and I'm going to fight back. And she literally fights back in that moment. And then she reflects on that, her experience when she's in the red room. And we see that in these chapters, in these months leading up to her going to Lowood, her changing her mind on what a person should be and questioning it. And I think that that is something where it's, it's always hard to hear about Jane's super abusive situation that she's in Mm -hmm. and to be like, why would we listen to a story about a child being hurt like this? And the truth is it's because in this time period, in this social structure, why would someone question as many things as Jane does Mm -hmm. and establishing that you have to question the norm because her norm is so awful as a child. Yeah. Yeah. And when she questions it, she realizes how wrong the expectations are. Mm -hmm. It it would make you question everything. Well, exactly. That's in the story, but I have yet to see that level of understanding come through in a movie. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I would want them to do it, but they haven't done it yet. 
Yeah, I would say just off the top of my head from what I can recall, the closest to that I've seen is in the 91 that has Anna Paquin as the little Jane, one of my favorite little Janes. Uh, And it's a very 90s like show of strength when she stands up next to Helen and they flip their hair down and they're like, cut our hair. And it's very like not what's in the story. But that's kind of I feel like the movie that I can think of where that's sort of like enough is enough. I'm questioning authority because it is sort of this like youthful rebellion exploration. Uh, And I think that moment there where you say, you know, we start with her fighting back. There is our first glimpse of strength in Jane, right? Yes. And it's it's seen through physical strength, but we will see it evolve through um, emotional strength and wisdom as well, which I love seeing this character growth for her because you were talking about, you know, her questioning this society and like, why do we have to put up with this abuse? And I actually have uh, a passage here again, which I think is one of the most beautiful chunks in the the early section of this book when she's having this kind of moral discussion with Helen, because Helen is very much someone who is preaching, you know, she's very, uh, I would not, I don't know, religious is the right word, but she, she reads the Bible. She's like, we should do as, you know, Jesus says, love thy neighbor and stuff like that. But I love that little Jane comes back to her with this and says, If people were always kind and obedient to those who are cruel and unjust, the wicked people would have it all their own way. They would never feel afraid, and so they would never alter, but would grow worse and worse. When we are struck at without reason, we should strike back again very hard. I am sure we should. So hard as to teach the people who struck us never to do it again. And that is, I think, a a kind of vengeance that we don't see later on. And obviously we'll have to see how it, it is in the book, but she's very more so in the movies and the TV adaptations as an adult, I think takes on these lessons that she learned from Helen of forgiveness and we must like turn the other cheek sort of a thing. So I love the child rebellion in her of being like, I just started fighting back. You should fight back too. Like I love when she talks about the switch. She's like, I'd break it under her nose. And Helen's like, probably you wouldn't do that. You're just talking. <laughs> but like it's, I love this kind of fire in her that we first have. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that evolution of character is, is the, is the part that I think is so critical in what you're referencing there, because the, I think we see a lot of that moment of strength in mm-hmm. Jane and that moment of things being different and she's fighting back. What I think isn't is is often missed in the movies that is so critical to contextualizing that moment is it's not just a moment of Jane fighting back. It's mm-hmm. the first moment of Jane fighting back. Yes. Because there's a it's easy when watching Jane Eyre to think that that's always been how she is. And that's why these people in her life don't like her and are cruel to her is because she's always been this rebellious girl who, when she gets hit in the face with a book, she also hits him in the face. And it's like, don't do that. Um, <laughs> like, so, so that's kind of, that was sort of my perception is I had this misunderstanding that Jane was always this strong, rebellious girl and people didn't like that about her. Mm-hmm. No, Jane tried to be what people thought she quote unquote should be. Mm-hmm. And it didn't work. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things that I love so much in the moments when she starts to fight back and in these this time at Gateshead that we're l- with her and through these months where she's with Bessie and all of that stuff, the moments, she doesn't just become someone who is constantly rebelling and constantly yelling. And I think that her time with Helen and Miss Temple takes that evolution and and takes it to the next level, right? Of like, how do you both be good and, and strong? How do you be both of those things? Mm -hmm. Where I think that time at Gateshead between getting hit in the head with a book and, and moving forward is where we see her, her fighting back for the first time. And I think we see that with her speech to Mrs. Reed, like that hits different when you yeah. know that up until that point, she has only ever done what she's been told to do. Mm-hmm. And Mrs. Reed still hated her. And it's actually a moment that I want to talk a lot more about, but I don't want to, again, monologue forever. So go ahead. No worries. I have a feeling that these book episodes for us are going to be very like, hang on, let me stand on my soapbox <laughs> for a second. <laughs> um, but so like, that's, again, we keep we're going to say this all the time, I'm sure, but the levels of complexity of all these characters. And so with Jane, you know, um, where you said before this point, you know, she was trying to please, I think that hasn't completely left her, right? Mm -hmm, Like that's still mm -hmm. something that is a great desire for her. And a line that I wrote down, there's just so much, so much sadness in this child. It's, uh, let's see, in chapter 
eight, yes, um, there is a line that she says, if others don't love me, I would rather die than live. I cannot bear to be solitary and hated. And Mm -hmm. it's her speaking to Helen. And so there is equally this desire in her to rage against those who hate her, but also there's this desire to be loved. And I think that is kind of where initial Jane was, is just being like, maybe if I'm subservient to this awful family, they'll love me. And that turned out not to be true. So eventually she's like, well, I cast you aside. But I do think as she's now in Lowood, this desire resurfaces to be like, these people don't know me or my past. It's a fresh page for me. I want to be loved by these people now. And Mm -hmm. at first that is also dashed by Brocklehurst, but luckily people come in and kind of help. So, And I also, I think it's interesting that you point out that she casts them aside. And I think that that is absolutely something that she does and should do. But something that I noted in those last moments that we have at Gateshead, Mm-hmm. She has a whole other level of that strength, right? Like, cause any, in a very human way that, that Charlotte Bronte does in this book, you make bold statements, you decide you're going to live your life differently. And then you kind of do, and it's a process and it, mm-hmm. and it evolves. And I think that anybody who's tried to make a really big change in their life can relate to that. Yeah. And I think we see that a lot in Jane in these months at Gateshead. And it's, it's that first moment of getting hit in the face with a book um, to the moment where she breaks with Aunt Reed. There's three months there. That is a yeah. good chunk of time where she's processing this information and trying it out and learning about things and all of that stuff. And, and being in her head in that moment where she's been told by Brocklehurst all of this garbage. And we will talk about him, but <laughs> I'm focusing on Aunt Reed right now. And she's listened to Aunt Reed say all these terrible things and she's held her tongue and she's not contradicted her in these moments, but she's standing there and you know that the previous version of Jane before this reflection on what she wants to be and how she wants to say would have just taken that and moved on. But instead she goes, I, this, I have to say something. I have to say something. Mm -hmm. Um, and she goes on her, her famous rant where she says, I'm not a liar. If I were, I would say, I love you. And she continues on with that. And what I found so impactful and under that, that again, that understanding of how she was before versus how she is now really changes it. It is in being rebellious and being strong that she gets what she really wanted from them, which is attention and affection. Yeah. Aunt Reed immediately gets her the affection. And Jane knows that's bullshit, right? Like she Mm -hmm. knows that this is garbage. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens shortly after that with Bessie, because Mm -hmm. Jane doesn't meet in the same way that if you've ever like stood up to someone or said something to somebody in a moment of frustration, there's an adrenaline rush that, that she very clearly is on. And so when Bessie comes in and like says, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Jane comes back with this energy of like, you, none of you guys should have done any of this shit. Like this is like, so <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> and just like says that to Bessie. And that's the first moment that we see Bessie coming back at her and talking to Jane back and having this affection back. And it makes you wonder mm-hmm. if Jane, ha- if, if Jane had been that way the whole time and she had always been honest and open and had that strength, Mm -hmm. obviously that's not going to work always in an abusive situation. The longer she was there, the less likely that was going to continue to work for her. Mm -hmm. But you see that lesson that she's learning, which is be honest and be strong and, and stand up for yourself because being meek and mild and just giving in all the time it's not going to get you what you want. So say what you mean and say what you want to say and have that strength up front. And maybe you will get what you want and you will get that authentic connection with people. Right. Which as we know from the movies and shows we've watched is something that instantly captures Rochester's attention. Like she's Mm -hmm. very straightforward. Mm -hmm. She speaks her mind. She's honest. And he's like, whoa, okay, cool. But I, I love that you mentioned that when she confronts Miss Reed in the novel, Miss Reed instantly, you're right. She's like, she's like, oh no, like she becomes kind of like, I think she's partially scared of this threat from this child, but then also like, I think she's trying to regain, um, maybe just to reconfirm, 
firm for herself that she's not as awful as she knows herself to be and as this child has just called her out to be. But it's something, again, you're right, we have not, I don't think we've seen that level of fear and remorse in her in movies because typically Aunt Reed will get flustered and be like, get out of my house. And I really thought this was a powerful moment where she's like, she's like, she starts calling her pet name. She's like, dear sweetie, no, like we liked you. And it's like, yeah, save your lies. It's fine. But I thought that was an interesting, the power was shifted briefly for Jane. Mm -hmm. it, suddenly she had the control of that moment. And, and to be clear, I don't think Jane would have, like, I don't think it would have worked out if with her and Aunt Reed, if Jane had just been like yelling all the time. I think oh, no. it's a classic abuse response when someone, when you've used a particular way of abusing somebody to control them for a mm -hmm. certain amount of time. And that has worked, mm -hmm. which is tell Jane, she's shitty. Tell Jane, she has to be good. Jane will be good. I get to keep telling her she's shitty and keep controlling her and keep getting her to be in the box that I want her to be in. When that stops working, you can use this other kind of control and manipulation, mm -hmm. which is kindness. Yeah. In, in the case of Miss R Mrs. Reed, that is an abusive choice that she is still making. So yes. it, it's not her having genuine affection for Jane. That's right. not what we're saying here. Right. It is still abuse. It's just mm -hmm. a different kind of abuse. And it's, it's, it's absolutely that she loses the control in that moment and mm -hmm. how she's going to gain it back is by giving Jane what Jane wants in the hopes that that will then make Jane submissive again and not yeah. because like you've pointed out, Jane could go out and, and destroy this woman if she wanted to. Mm -hmm. Um, and Mrs. Reed's position is fairly precarious. It doesn't mean you get to abuse a child. Yeah. But she I, doesn't have a lot of power in this society relative to other people. She well, has money and a house and all that stuff. Especially, power. Anyway, especially well. since her, her troublesome son, once he's of age, uh, he will be the Lord mm -hmm. of the estate and then she will have to do whatever he wants. But already when he's still a child, he bullies his mother as much as he mm -hmm. bullies his siblings. And it's very interesting. It's pointed out like how he, he drinks, he calls her that nickname, his mother, he like calls her old girl or something like that. Mm -hmm. And she just kind of laughs it off. There's like, I think equally she is inevitably afraid of you know this awful boy that she sucked at raising mm -hmm. like having all the power over the family's lives and he is already off to a bad start so she knows it's going to be awful so I think maybe she's just trying to like kiss up to her child and be like oh mommy loves you be nice to me and it's just like oh boy your life is awful too isn't it <laughs> well and it's it's again it's those different types of control that Mrs. Yeah. Reed can can exert over her situation and she has fairly limited levels of control that she can exert over John. And she has fairly limited levels of control that she chooses to exert over her girls. But Jane is someone she can control yeah. in any way she feels like it. Mm -hmm. And she hates her because she can't, she's, she's forced into caring for this child when she doesn't want to, mm -hmm. um, which ooh, I hate it so much, um, <laughs> but, but it's also that Jane is someone she can control and manipulate. And it's the same way you, I totally believe she treats all her servants like that too. Like, yeah, I completely believe that she's awful to Bessie and she's mm -hmm. awful to these other women who work in her house because the people that she can be like, overtly awful to, she is. Yes. Yeah. I want to take a quick sidestep from talking about awful Aunt Reed and the Reeds in general and bring in a little bit of uh, positive uh, discussion and analysis to a theme mm -hmm. that kind of relates to something that we sort of started touching on before when we were talking about, you know, the child's mindset that Bronte captures and how Jane sees the world. And the thing that really stood out to me that I found incredibly enjoyable and charming about glimpses within Jane's life is we see this great level, I think, of wonder and imagination that Jane has. It first struck me there's a beautiful passage uh, early on when she's talking about reading some of the books in the library, and they describe these scenes. And in describing the way that Jane remembers the scenes in the book, 
it is also this very beautiful and vivid imagery, which I love seeing because you know right from the bat, from the start, like this is going to be part of why she's such a good artist because she has this vivid mm-hmm. imagination. And it's all these epic scenes of like two ships sinking in a great like storm out at sea, a strange horned figure crouched upon this archway as people in the distance watch like a hanging happening. And a, I love that there's a scene where apparently like there's a man getting attacked by by a brigand on the road, but that was too scary for Jane. So she passed over that one. But this initially we get these instances of these, these images that I, Mm -hmm. that really stood out to me. And there's a couple other moments of beautiful imagery and whimsy in her. Uh, One of my favorite parts of this entire section is when spring comes Mm -hmm. to Lowood school, which I thought like, so she opens the chapter by spending like a couple pages kind of describing how nature returned to this area. And she describes getting to walk through the woods and the -hmm. the flowers and the plants that came back and the the bubbling brook and all of these things. And it's beautifully coincided with at the same time that nature is returning to the land, death and disease has descended upon the school. And I think again, in this wonderful way of capturing how a child understands things, Like she reflects on the fact that people were sick and dying, but also there were less people at the school. So Jane got more food. Like the other girls got more food. They got more freedom and free time. And so there, I love that she remembers both of these things. She remembers it was a time of sickness, but it was also a time of beauty and freedom when they could go off into the woods and go have fun and be free. And so there are instances like that, that I thought were incredibly charming and beautiful. And I loved that. That was one of my favorite passages. Yeah, absolutely. That whole passage, when you first started talking about it, that's what stuck out in my mind is those moments when she's in the woods with Mary. I can't remember her name. The girl who isn't Helen, which I love. She's like, I bet you're wondering where Helen is while she's sick in bed. I'm like, oh no. Because she's dying. Remember all those weird coughs I referenced? Turns out. (laughs) But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really interesting to listen to her describe kind of be out, being out there and having this be really the first time that Jane has frivolous freedom to do Mm -hmm. what it is that she wants. And what she chooses to do at that time is go tell stories in the woods with her friends, with this beautiful nature scene that she's described. And, and like you said, it's so interesting knowing what we know about Jane, listening to that evolution of like the pictures in her head to drawing for the first time and learning how to do that and how well that sat with her and how just immediately she really loved that. And then during these descriptions of nature, she talks about how she wants to draw this and she's going to draw that and she's going to capture this. And it is, it's the way that when you look back on childhood, there's so many of those things where it's like the moments that you remember versus the moments, like what was happening for the adults around you in that time. Um, And I think that that's a really interesting way to approach a child's perception of, of something like what happened at Willwood school during that time. And to be able to integrate in that idea of an artist with that visual mind and how that evolved during a time when there was this great tragedy that, that also held a lot of hope surrounding it for Jane. Well, I personally view that also as a source of her inner strength is to be able to find beauty in the world when such hard things are happening. And I think it's something Mm -hmm. that she only got the opportunity to do at Lulwood. Like maybe she wouldn't be able to find that beauty if she had stayed at Gateshead. Uh, But so that was, I thought, a great evolution for her. So along with this, you know, we see these kind of elements of appreciation for the whimsy of nature. I think also one thing that I love that really stood out to me is we also get to see into the semi-magical way that a child interprets Mm -hmm. certain things in the world, right? Because of course we talk about her fear, her legitimate fear of the ghost of her uncle Mm -hmm. in the red room. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a moment when she talks about fairy tales, but her, the way that she reasons it is not that fairies and elves don't exist. It's simply that they're gone now. They left England. Yeah. And these are stories I think that she recalls from things that Bessie told her. Yeah. But then I also really loved the moment when she's talking with Helen about her beliefs and Helen talks about uh, there are angels who who walk amongst us and who look mm-hmm. over us. And she refers to it as this hidden world that exists alongside our own. And I love that 
it's important to plant those seeds as well, because this I'm sure is something that will kind of, she will reflect on when she starts to, you know, see the weird things at uh, Thornfield, mm-hmm. but doesn't know what they are. And so I know that a lot of versions have kind of alluded to ghosts and I really hope the book does that, but it's also kind of leads into this magical realism of eventually mm-hmm. hearing your lover's voice from miles and miles mm-hmm. away. So all of these initial things, um, Bronte just is killing it with like yes. laying the groundwork for an epic story. <laughs> completely, I completely agree. I think there's those moments in the red room. I think that's one another moment where it it plays really differently in movies. I understand why it plays the way that it does. And I think one of the things that I find really interesting in this project that you and I are going through of, of watching all these adaptions and, and kind of reading this book is uh, the more that I'm reading the book and going, well, I understand why you would interpret it that way, but why has everyone interpreted it that way? And I think that that's the, that's the cultural, we, you do an adaption, then you do another adaption, then you do another adaption. There's no way that the person doing the 2006 BBC miniseries didn't watch the 43 movie, didn't watch the 70s one, didn't watch the 80s one, didn't watch all the 90s movies. Like they've all seen each yeah. other's understanding of this. Yeah, that's so a good point. while the source material is a is a contextualizing this, mm-hmm. so are the other interpretations of it. Yeah. So interpretations of the red room scene in particular, I think is so interesting because in order to establish for the audience that there's, that the red room is haunted. Mm-hmm. Jane is scared to go in it initially in every adaption that we've seen. She's frightened of the red room the second they bring her in the room. In the book, she's not scared at all when they first go in. Mm-hmm. It's while she's in the room and while she's reflecting on these things, of course you can't do that without like a really intense, overly dramatic monologue over the top yeah. of it. So I understand why they did it the way they did it. But Jane's time in the Red Room, she's reflecting on all of these lessons of that moment of breaking that we talked about that it starts Mm -hmm. with. And that magical realism that you're talking about comes in as she starts to have this incredible imagination that children, specifically like somebody who manufactures parts of slippers and books and stuff might understand. (laughs) Um, So I think both Piper and I can uh, can relate to being a child with an active imagination. Oh, yes. Um, You get yourself so upset that then you ultimately think that there's a ghost in the room because as you reflect on your own experience, you're like, yeah, he's actually been shitty to me. I bet Uncle Reed would be pissed. Oh my Mm -hmm. God, his ghost is for sure here. Oh, dude. And like, that was an incredibly relatable scene, especially the moment that struck out to me is when she catches a glimpse of herself in the mirror Mm -hmm. and it just like surprises her. And that's kind of like, I think what starts her freaking out about different things. Mm -hmm. Cause I've definitely been at like my grandparents' house and they had a mirror at the end of a hallway. And if the lights were off and I walked past it and you caught like any kind of glimmer of light, I was like, Oh, like it just became like instantly scary, you know? And Yeah. The idea that somebody died in a room is also like a creepy experience. You're like, no, someone dead was in here. This is horrifying. Just the thought of that, even though it's just a room, Mm -hmm. but you know, who knows what else could happen? Yeah. Yeah. But I think that that's, that, that would be, I think the very first moment with the book is, is a moment where I've been disappointed in reading that. I'm disappointed how every other interpretation of that moment, I think misses part of the point Mm -hmm. and that this is, this is a distinct, different moment that needs to be contextualized. And the idea that Jane is an incredibly good child up until then, like, and their definition of good, I, I always hesitate to say good child, but like right. their definition of good and is trying to meet those standards up until this moment when she decides she's going to live by her standards. Yeah. And I think very some the almost the opposite of that, the red room, I'm like, I get why you couldn't do it the way the book did it. Like I get why you choose to do it the way you're doing it. It's just interesting that that's what you all did. Mm -hmm. Another moment that I actually think is probably the closest in almost every adaption to what we've seen in the book is Mr. Broccoli coming in and being a dick. Yes. I don't know how much we really need to talk about Mr. Broccoli because not much because we know his character, he's like he's the same. This, this man is garbage. He's gar. They do a great job of making the garbage man garbage in the movies. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way about this dude. I literally, the only note I have in my notes about him is go to hell, go directly hell. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. 
The thing that I liked that we got from the book that really stood out to me is I love that Jane continues to describe him as a great pillar or a column of architecture. From her tiny little perspective, like literally physically looking up at this person, he just looks like a big straight rod of a scary man. And I think the version that did that best was the one with the guy from Citizen Kane, the 40s one. Yeah, that one. Orson Welles, the Orson Welles one. They really did a good job with camera angles when young Jane is in a room with adults of like shooting from below to kind of create that towering uh, Mm -hmm. impression of adults and scary adults. So I loved that. Uh, Mr. Broccoli, we we know him. We hate him. We hate the way that he treats his children like they're little princesses and other people's children like they need to be treated like garbage. I like that he got fired essentially for real in the book. Mm-hmm. We've only seen that in one other adaption. I wish every adaption he got fired. <laughs> um, but a character that we don't see in a lot of adaptions and I wish we saw more of, we, she's in a few of them, but she's not in as many as I would like is Miss Temple. Miss I think Temple. she's an incredible character. I think she's she's another great example of a very three-dimensional character. I think she really embodies something we talk about a lot when we discuss Jane Eyre, which is the different types of feminine strength. And by yeah. having lots of female characters, you can have different types of feminine strength. Miss mm-hmm. Temple is a, an amazing character who she is strong and kind and her yeah. kindness it's this it's this misinterpretation that i think we still hold to this day the idea that by being kind you're weak mm-hmm. i think miss temple is a character who is every position of everyone else in a position of power around her wants her to behave in a certain way and to treat the cer- children a certain way and she's operating within really constrained circumstances and still is creating a safe caring environment for these children yeah um and i think it's incredible to watch and she's so so well done and i i wrote down that i think the more we i read about miss temple the more that i was like this is how jane knows how to be who what she is for adele yeah. Miss Temple is her template for what an adult in a child life should be. Exactly. Which, uh, again, I, I mean, you've said most of what I would want to say about her is like, yes, her kindness is her strength. Uh, I think especially given kind of also to elaborate on something you touched on too, given the circumstances that she has and the resources she has to work with, right? That's a a thing that really struck me um, in reading the book that I didn't necessarily pick up on on other things is I think she clearly like hates the, the situation as much as the girls do. Like she, if she could, you know, that she would like get them more food and, and roaring fires and better clothes and all these things. And so I love that one of the things that struck me is when uh, Miss Temple brings Jane and Helen into her apartments and she has Mm -hmm. them for tea. That is such a wonderful thing to do to impressionable children as well, I think, is to treat them not as children, but as equals and adults and be like, oh, well, you're my guest, so I'm going to serve Mm -hmm. you tea and I'm going to ring for treats and cakes. And that's not just like, well, you're little kids, here's the thing. It's like, no, like this is just what people do when they're kind to one another. And I loved uh, Jane getting to see that. And Mm -hmm. you can see definitely like the wonder that she feels towards this woman. And like you said, Miss Temple is her template. And Mm -hmm. so when she leaves, Jane thinks to herself, well, maybe I can leave too. You know, she's still taking inspiration from her. And uh, adult moments for Jane already have gotten me very excited to read about her. But I'm like, oh, I love the way that you, you think now and how you compose yourself. It's great. <laughs> yeah. And I think the, the moment that you talked about with the, her treating her like a guest and showing her this kindness, I think Miss Temple has such an emotional intelligence that is incredible to see because that moment in the book, I think that where that moment plays matters so much because Jane starts off by saying to Helen, so she's, she's coming into Lowood with this explicit strength that we've talked about. She's a little bit hands on her hips, going to break a vase about it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and she says the thing about like, if she were going to hit me, I would break her stick and I wouldn't just stand for it. And then we watch her right after that, get put on a stool and called a liar and her in her head, she's going, God, I actually am so weak and so pathetic that I can't even stand up for myself in these moments because she is 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And, and why would she, because there's, 
all of these adults have so much power over her and what is she supposed to do? But she has very high expectations for herself. So she feels so many layers in that moment. One, she's being framed up in a way where she believes because of her experience from Gateshead that she's going to lose all of the progress that she's made and all these people who she really likes. And she feels like she's starting to get understanding from are going to hate her now. Mm -hmm. And two, she's disappointed in herself Mm -hmm. for allowing that to happen. And that's when she has that moment of, I would I would do whatever it takes for people to love me, which is so contradictory Mm -hmm. to the moment later that we know about in the book where she says, I would live alone if that's what honor required, which I found so interesting to listen to. So we've seen this moment of she's so disappointed in herself. Helen comes in and goes, people don't hate you. They hate broccoli because he's such a dick and people Mm -hmm. can see that. And of course, they're not going to hate you. And also if they did hate you, great news. God, my main man, my favorite <laughs> dude, he loves you anyway, because he sees who you are in your spirit. And I know that you're not a liar and you know that you're not a liar and that's yeah. what really matters. So you have to know in yourself who you are and what matters and not let external things be what defines that. And so she's yeah. having this, this moment of, of sadness and being lifted up by Helen. And then Miss Temple comes in and treats her like a person, yeah. knowing mm-hmm. that that's what that child needs in that moment. She didn't, Jane didn't need another person coming in and telling her how to think and feel about what just happened. She needed somebody to come in and say, come to my office, come have some tea. Let's talk this through. Tell me what really happened. I believe you. I also have to say it's such a relief to see in a story where a kid is getting, you know, like bullied or like accused of things or whatever. It's such a relief to see a teacher or an authority figure who actually has their freaking eyes open and sees mm-hmm. what's going on and is like, okay, no, don't worry. I saw that you dropped the tablet by mistake. It was an accident. Yeah. I'm going to take care of this. It makes me so mad in other like contemporary fiction where it's like the teacher is blind to the cruelty that's happening in their classroom, like right in front of them. And I'm like, come on, you know, what's going on. Say something, do something. That's your job. Well, so. and it's such a, it's such a distinction between Mrs. Reed, mm-hmm. who's supposed to be this figure for her, who the claim is that Mrs. Reed never saw it, but there's sort of an implication that Mrs. Reed intentionally didn't see the abuse that John was, was throwing on her. Mm-hmm. And, and I completely believe that even if she had explicitly seen it, um, she still would have let John get away with that. Um, and then Miss Temple is the opposite of that. Miss Temple has less power than Mrs. Reed did. Yeah. And she's still utilizing that power in this, again, super specific way of, mm-hmm. You, she, she didn't stand up in front of Mr. Broccoli and go, you can't do this to Jane. You have to let Jane go. Jane's a good little girl. And how could you do this? She operates within the constraints that she has. She Mm -hmm. has these constraints. There's no, if she did that, she'd get fired. And then she wouldn't be able to do anything for these girls. So I think that that's such an interesting layered nuanced way to approach it, to still be a good person within the constraints that she has. And we see Jane operating within that every time and, Mm -hmm. and, and figuring out where that line is and should be. Yeah, no. And I love that it kind of plays into sort of the lessons that Helen is trying to also impart Mm -hmm. on her of this, like, you know, there's a, a peaceful way to go about resolving these things or like the forgiveness aspect. Um, they're both kind of that uh, positive influence on her during this very uh, influential time in her life. Uh, we should talk quickly about Helen because um, <laughs> I love her and it makes me now mad if there's ever a version that cuts her out, which most versions have Helen, but losing Helen and Helen's death is so important and impactful in Mm -hmm. Jane's life. And I think that moment of her leaving is a beautifully spiritual moment. I know it's something that's discussed kind of heavily in the Hot and Bothered uh, podcast is talking about, you know, spirituality and um, Bronte's relationship with God and religion because her father was a clergyman. And I think that's beautiful to see those elements explored. Uh, some lines that I highlighted are when Jane is asking Helen the big questions where she's like, what is God? Where is he? And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like no one can answer that sweet pea. But I love Helen's childlike um, being like, well, this is what I think is true and all these beautiful things. And it's so nice to envision her passing in peacefully. And who yeah. knows if she actually did. Um, but 
it's, I think, part of her graceful nature to comfort others. And so maybe she was in a great deal of pain, but she says these sweet things to comfort her friend as she herself is the one slipping away. Yeah. But those were so beautiful. And I love the genuine intimacy between these two young girls. And it wasn't obviously anything romantic, but it's a physical affection that I think Jane has been deprived of her entire life of getting to hug and kiss someone dear to you. And that was beautifully written as well, where it's like I wrapped my arms around her neck, I kissed her and she kissed me. And I'm like, this is so tender and sweet. And I just loved it to pieces. And I think it's probably in the world that she is in there won't be chances again for that kind of like physical touch from someone until eventually she and Rochester have a big makeout session in a garden. But <laughs> <laughs> So I'm like, hold that little moment in your heart, Jane. More will come eventually. Yeah. I agree with you that Helen is such an important qu- character. I think one of the things that some of the adaptions do, but really struck me in the book is they have that age difference. So Helen's supposed to be like 14 and, mm-hmm. um, Jane is like 10, which Mm -hmm. makes the difference in the way that she's talking to Jane make a lot of sense. Jane, her other friend that she references is also older than her. So I think choosing to spend her time with people who are older than her, I think those are people she relates to more. Mm -hmm. And she likes having conversations with somebody who's a little bit more on that intellectual side, sort of regardless of age. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something that comes back later. (laughs) (laughs) But I also think there's a lot of descriptions when they're in Miss Temple's office in that same moment that we talked about with Jane and that kindness, where Jane is just listening to Miss Temple and Helen talk. And it really breaks my heart knowing that Helen dies, Mm -hmm. hearing the way she lights up and the description of who she is and all of this stuff. And there's a, there's a moment in the book where she says Helen was living, like she was going to die soon. Like (laughs) that's like not explicitly what she says, but she sort of says that. Mm -hmm. And that really, um, it broke my heart because you you think for a moment, what could Helen have been if she had been able to live and if she had had, a whole life. And, um, and that, that's that potential and that light that she has that going away, but Jane catching that and being like, I'm going to keep holding on to these things that Helen had, I think is so critical. And I also, I found it particularly funny, all those moments when she's asking those questions that you referenced, she's doing that while Helen's like dying, which yeah. like the <laughs> age like, difference is a really important part about that. Cause it's like, when you're 10, a 14 year old seems like they understand everything about the mm-hmm. world. So yeah. Helen would of course have the answers about where is God, but I, I think lo- Helen's Helen's security in the uncertainty when Jane mm-hmm. wants tangible answers yeah, and Helen's response of like, I don't know where God is, but I love him and he loves me. And I know that. Mm-hmm. And I know that wherever I go, it's going to be a continuation of that. Yeah, Um, I think is really beautiful because Jane doesn't feel comfortable in the uncertainty. She wants the answers. Well, I think that's also to like look at the author writing it as well as maybe like her own inner kind of conversation about this great big spiritual question of like, what do I feel? Maybe both Helen and Jane are reflecting of, you know, her very human like feelings about these these big spiritual things. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I really love what you said, Lillian, where... Jane carries Helen's light forward in life. And that is beautiful. That's, Mm -hmm. I love that. That's great. Well, um, (laughs) we've said a lot of really good things about this book. And I always like to say at least one bad thing. What Um, is your one bad thing? I just, I the only negative note I wrote down in the whole time that we're reading this. So I've complained a lot about moments of like, maybe that's a little bit too much detail. Chapter 10, baby. Poof. I did not need to know about the details of your walk to and from the post office and how excited you were about waiting for the next letter. And then all of that, all of that detail felt like an instruction manual for how to get a job in 1847, which great news time travel. If it's real, I'll be able to get a job in 1847, but woof to Jeff, Charlotte, that was a lot. I'm pretty sure they say something similar about that with like the instructions of how to do that in the hot and bothered podcast. So you, you should listen to that and relate super hard with them. I didn't mind that at all. I, I think at that point I was just so excited to see who adult Jane is or who 18 year old Mm -hmm. Jane is. Um, I found actually quite enchanted by the scenes of her sitting in her room and opening the window and leaning out upon the sill. 
I visualized, that I loved. yeah, I visualized that so clearly in my mind of Jane kind of like, you know, anxiously pacing her room and laying down and thinking to herself, like, what am I going to do? She's like, well, I'm not trapped here. I could do something and kind of working out this problem. I imagine, I love there was a note where she's like, it was in quotations. And then in parentheses, she's like, this was all in my head. I don't talk aloud to myself, by the way. <laughs> like she wrote that in the book and I'm like, cute. It's so adorable. I um, liked the moment of her like wandering around being like, oh God, what should I do? Well, probably should lay down. And then she full has a conversation with herself. But how would I get a job? Well, you would do it this way. And she's mm-hmm. like, the answers were on my pillow. <laughs> um, Charlotte, hon, you doing okay? Dude, I love it. I thought it was very cute. And we get a nice sort of little wrap up to this first chapter of her life where before she leaves, she gets to have some parting words with Bessie, Mm -hmm. which again, we see growth and development in this character. Uh, Bessie comes and now that she is no longer quite so burdened, I think, with having to raise uh, troublesome children, except for her own son, who she brings with her, which I thought was very cute. She seems much more relaxed. um, But also it seems that she's kind of just more comfortable talking with adults, where maybe that was part of it, is with little Jane. She's like, I don't know what to do with you. But here she sees adult Jane, and she's just, you know, assessing her and praising her talents, which I loved that I thought it was her own way of kindness to every talent that Jane had. She would affirm for her she's like well you do this better than Georgiana or what's her name she's mm-hmm. like you sing like you play way better than her and you paint way better than her and like her little and ways I always of- knew you'd be impressive Jane I'm like wouldn't it have been cool if you made that little girl feel like that yeah um so that was that was nice I kind of liked that send-off of kind of mm-hmm. being like now I can sort of like put a little bow on this chapter of my life and let's move forward so yeah I wonder yeah. what's gonna happen One of the things that they reference a lot in that last chapter is frequently she's like, well, I didn't want to get myself into a pickle. That would have been bad. (laughs) And I'm like, maybe, like, maybe you're going to get in a pickle, honey bun. Like, she's like, I mean, I only had the one letter. This could have been bad. I could have ended up somewhere super weird. (laughs) Oh, no. It is kind of fate almost. It seems that she's sort of like laying that seed of like, well, there was only one reply and it is what led me to where I am. And it's like, it is very, we are drawn to one another. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's curious. But yeah, soon we'll be at uh, Thornfield and we'll get to see what happens in that big old house. Well, we've got we've got a couple weeks before we uh, will be discussing that for you, our our lovely listeners, um, because next week we're going to be talking about something completely different, which is another adaptation of Jane Eyre, and Yay! this one is our first uh, non English one. I think I don't think it's in English. I think it's in Hindi. Yeah. Um, but it's uh oh, I'm gonna make you say it. Okay, uh, send it to me in the chat. I'm putting it I'll do my best to pronounce it. Um, so this is a Bollywood film from the 50s, right? From 1952. It is a Bollywood um, Hindi version. Awesome. And it looks as if, so it's just one word, uh, Sangdil, I would say, is how you pronounce that. But yeah, I am so excited for this. Uh, I will go into this in much detail in the next episode, but I'm a huge Bollywood fan. I really got into it when I was in college. And uh, there's a different... Bollywood movies are very different from Western films. They typically span multiple genres. They're usually very long, like two to three hours is pretty typical. And I'm very curious to see how an older Bollywood movie will compare to the structure of a modern one, because a modern one, it can be, it's always, there's always almost always a romantic element. It'll go from an action flick to a drama, to a comedy. It'll span all of these things. There's always musical numbers, whether it makes sense or not. Uh, So I'm very, very excited. I'm excited as well. I do not watch a lot of Bollywood, so I'll be coming in with a totally different perspective than Piper. Piper, always our expert, me, always the um, novice. (laughs) No, it's always true, 100% of the time. Piper always, she actually legally said before we started this podcast that she'd only do things that she knows more about than me. Well, then remember when we talked about Bridgerton and... (laughs) I knew nothing and you knew everything. <laughs> who's, who's to say, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, on that big laugh note, uh, thank you for listening along with us, for reading along with us. Uh, Lillian, just in case people want to do the exact same chapters, do you have that pulled up for the next chunk that we're going to do? I do. So we read through chapter 10. So the next chunk is going to be chapter 10 
or chapter 11, we read chapter 10 again, chapter 11 through to chapter 25. So read through chapter 24 to chapter 25. In my book, that's page 168. Cool. Great. Sweet. Well, join us in this read along. Um, and if you have thoughts about our thoughts or other things that you want to share, uh, you can send us your notes and feedback uh, either via email. We are airbuds at gmail.com or on all of our fun uh, social platforms at airbuds. Uh, come and find us, reach out, tell us your thoughts and recommend new uh, adaptations and uh, send us links of where to find them so we can keep this up as long as possible. Um, and this week I will be in the Kmart parking lot to fight anyone who disagrees with me from Friday to Wednesday, <laughs> 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. per always. And I will be in the Kmart parking lot providing ice packs and <laughs> bottles of water <laughs> for afterwards. <laughs> she got the, she got a big pack of those ices last time. I don't know if she'll have them again or not. But yeah, we'll see. Something to think about. We'll see. <laughs> well, On that you super weird note, thank you all. <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.